cope when you discover your child has a disability? What do you do and where do you go? I'm Esther Bloom. Join us now as our guests share their journey from the darkness of despair to the lightness of hope. Gail Slate is an author, family therapist, and founder of Kids Included Together, affectionately known as KIT. Christine Duare is a parent of a disabled child, mother of Erin Duare, a recent graduate of Cal State University, San Marcos, with a BA in communication. Welcome to Pace TV. Your stories will inspire our viewers to go beyond just surviving and coping. What a delight to have you here, to be able to speak about what must have been a great deal of pain in, in all of your lives. And here you are in sunny colors and sunny dispositions, <laughs> and, and we're so happy that you are willing to share your stories. Gail, how did you react when you <clears throat> learned that your dreams of a perfect child were shattered? It was very difficult for me. I was 20 years old, and I was barely able to take care of any child, let alone a child with a disability. I thought that my life was over. And how did your life change? How was it altered having a child with disabilities? Well, she was born in 1956. And in those days, there was really nothing available for children until she turned two. And UCLA promised to have a program that really might help her. Um, up until that time, I really didn't know where to go. I searched everywhere to help her. And we've tried, we tried every kind of therapy, but to no avail. But then UCLA came along, and Dr. Margaret Jones, who was the very famous physician, <coughs> excuse me, who worked uh, long and hard with children with disabilities, and especially cerebral palsy. And I thought she was our hope. This is where Dana would really progress and do well. And did she? Well, in fact, she did not. Um, she was there for about two years, and she was told, we were told, that she was never going to progress past a young child and probably would not live past puberty. Well, that must have been very crushing. <clears throat> How did you deal with that? How were the family dynamics during all this period? I'm sure you had parents and a spouse. and you were not handling all of this alone. How, how did that happen? I would like to say that I wasn't handling it alone, but in fact, I was. At that time, my husband was traveling to, the, uh, to Asia and was gone six months uh, th during the first year of her birth, and then later, he was building up a new business. My family grieved as much as we did. They, we were all in the same boat. Mm -hmm. We didn't know what to do or what to, what to say. So I would say that when it came time, when I had that diagnosis, the prognosis for Dana, it was as though I had lost my child. When we finally um, realized that, we looked out everywhere uh, for other places to help her. But then, unfortunately, there was nothing still, uh, nothing available until a very wonderful place called Hillside House. And this was a place that we felt she had to be because I was becoming more and more physically ill, mentally ill, and very depressed. So we placed her in Hillside House, which is a beautiful place. It still exists today. Mm -hmm. And there are still people that I know from that era and that are still there. That must have been a difficult choice, though, giving up your child and, right. and feeling like a failure at that point, exactly. I would imagine. I, you know, all I wanted to be was a mother. I wanted to be yeah. a good mother. I wanted to have lots of kids and really raise them happily. So I was not prepared at all for this. Well, were you afraid to have other children? Uh, <laughs> every time I was pregnant, just before I would have the child, and I had cesarean birth because mm -hmm. Dana was the result of a birth accident. Mm -hmm and a bad decision by a doctor, unfortunately. 
So I changed doctors each time I had a baby. And just before I would give birth, I had dates of when she would be delivered. My blood pressure would rise to 250. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And I was really young. And, mm -hmm. and I used to reassure the doctors not to worry. I was just nervous. Mm -hmm. So we were scared, very scared. Well, you did have other children then. Well, I had two other children. I had a son, Scott, mm -hmm. who is now 50, and um, Heidi, who's, I, I don't know if I should tell her age, but uh -uh. <laughs> it's okay, I'll try it, 46. Uh -huh. So, and they really uh, have been, even though Dana didn't live at home, they were very involved with Dana mm -hmm. and her life. Well, as we were. that probably was a reflection of your attitude of being so accepting of, of the situation and nurturing your child even though she may not even have been aware of your presence. I hope she was aware. I, I uh, think so. I think, I think there are ways of communication that we don't know. Right. That's why they even tell you to talk to somebody who's in a coma That's because right. they feel mm -hmm. that somehow you can communicate. So after Dana died, what became a turning point in your life? Well, I'd like to say that something happened immediately, but in fact, after she died, I was grieving yet again, and I never wanted to hear the word disability or see disabled people again in my life. I thought I couldn't take it. But a year later, I was asked to come back to UCLA to meet with the parents, the mothers who would be sitting behind a one-way mirror watching their children working with the, the uh, therapists and the physicians. And we talked. I stayed there for three hours. Now, the mothers weren't supposed to be there for three hours. Mm -hmm. They were there for an hour. But they really enjoyed speaking to me. And they went to the physician, the doctor who gave the sad prognosis, and asked if I could come back. Mm -hmm. I did. And then I was invited to come back again as a volunteer counselor, and I remained there for three years. And what did that lead to? Oh, my. <laughs> <laughs> well, um, there's a brief story. I'll tell you that the doctor uh, that I knew retired, and a young doctor came in, and she felt uncomfortable with having a volunteer counselor. So in essence, I was fired. And I thought, what am I going to do with my life? I love this. I love the parents. I'm glad I can help them. Might have been the best thing that happened to you. <laughs> it was the best thing. And in fact, that doctor later um, spoke to me about that. It was wonderful. So anyway, she, um, I, I decided I'm going to try going back to school and see if I can um, earn a degree in working with families of children with disabilities. So the quickest way to do it was getting a marriage and family therapy degree. And then I thought, well, I might have to go on for my PhD. But actually, my reputation had spread. And I opened a program for children with disabilities uh, with their parents attending as well. They came with their children. And I never had to go back for my PhD. So I was so busy working with the families. Uh, oh, you know. what's a title when you're doing so That's much right. 